in Hebrews 11, he's going through chat, uh, he's going through heroes of faith here. So a tribulation saint, a Jewish tribulation saint undergoing end times, he can apply himself to this chapter of faith. And a Christian church age saint can also apply to himself to this chapter of faith. Because this chapter on faith, so many of its practical aspects can be applied universally. Not just a Jew, not just a Gentile, not just a Christian church. It's a universal lesson, you can tell. So no matter what timeline you're in, tribulation or church age, it doesn't matter. This chapter, you can see work both ways. So now that we understand that, when I'm going to teach you Hebrews 11, I'm going to teach it as if it applies to you. It's a universal application that you can learn from. But sometimes you'll hear me mention tribulation Jewish saint and church age Christian saint, okay? So whenever I give those distinctions, you'll kind of hear me uh, say that here and there. All right, now that I got through that jibber jabber of that background, okay? That way you all can understand where we're at. Now let's get to this, all right? We've all been waiting for this, all right? So Hebrews 11 verse seven, this is good stuff. So the next biblical character is Noah. <coughs> Uh, let me get some water. Ugh, every time I'm about to start, you know. Oh, it's time. Good night, you know. <laughs> Let's go home. See you two weeks later, right? <laughs> All right, here we go. <clears throat> By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Okay, remember, I'm explaining each and every word to you. All right. So in other words, Noah had faith. Through his faith, this faith was, and it's connected to, him being warned of God, him heeding to the warning of God, which we know about the flood, of things not seen as yet. This is a flood he didn't see yet. Warnings and fearful uh, predictions from God of what would happen, Noah took it by faith, even though he didn't see it. So he got afraid. He was moved with fear. So notice right here, that within our Christian faith, or even within a tribulation, if he's undergoing the end times, both parties are going to have to have faith that's moved with fear. That's very healthy. For a Christian church, a saint, when he lives in fear, he stays away from sin, he stays away from trouble, and he'll get his reward in heaven, right? Yeah. A Christian never loses his salvation. Yeah. The yeah. salvation is in him, but then yes. when he, salvation is in him, he's working it out with fear, right. meaning then that the salvation cannot be lost, right? Yes. Otherwise, how can it be in him and he works it out, right? So then that, uh, we're going to see that at Philippians 2. Go to Philippians 2. Mm -hmm. Philippians chapter 2. Mm -hmm. For a tribulation saint, they have to have a faith and they are moved with fear. The reason why is the salvation, the tribulation is different from what Christians are going because Christians, we don't see the Antichrist. We're not in danger of 666. But tribulation saints, see, when they believe on Christ with that faith, they have to hold on to that faith so strongly that they cannot take the mark of the beast. So they cannot deny Jesus Christ during persecution. Now, that's a lot of work there. Christians, throughout 2,000 years of church history, uh, we've seen them undergo persecution, and we've seen some of them deny Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean they lost their salvation. But see, tribulation is different. Once you have that, it's game over. So that's why they have to have a lot of fear, and they have to hold on to their faith. Whereas for a Christian, it's very different. So we don't have to worry about losing our salvation. Look at Philippians chapter 2, and then we'll look at verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, some people will use this to teach you that you have to work for your salvation. No, that's not true. This is talking about works after your salvation not working for your salvation. 
In other words, you're working because you're saved. You're not working in order to get saved. Does that make sense? So this verse is pointing out right here, not to work for your salvation, but you're working because you already have salvation in you. Because how can you work out your salvation if the salvation wasn't in you to begin with? See that? Because look at verse 13. For it is God. See, it's explaining the reason why you're working out the salvation. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See, you can't work out unless salvation's already in there, unless you're already saved. See that? So we, uh, we're not worried about losing our salvation because it's in us. That's what the verse said, right? Mm -hmm. But then the verse is saying that we have to work it out yeah. and we have to be afraid. You might say, why? Because you got salvation in you. Right. Jesus Christ bled and died for you on the cross. Right. That's a high accountability and God's going to require much out of your life. After all Jesus sacrificed for you, and you got it in you, you're not afraid after that and you're, uh, and you're not going to do anything for him. Wow. That's heavy to think about. Preach. See that? So that's the reason why there's, there should be fear there. Uh, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we're not going to turn there, but every saved believer is going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible calls that a day of terror at verse 11. See, God's going to require something. Okay, you're saved, Christian. You can't lose your salvation. You're going to go to heaven with me. But what did you do for me? Wow. So it's going to be a scary time, the Bible says. All right, now we go to Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1. So I thought that uh, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and sound mind. Yes, but there's a difference with... A wrong kind of fear versus a right kind of fear. Amen. Didn't you know there are wrong fears and right fears in the Bible? I mean, for us, uh, it's good that we have a healthy right fear. You might say, why is that necessary? You need that because you want to be afraid, for example, of getting penalized and ending up in jail or prison. How many people are not afraid of that and they just end up there? Come on. Right? right? See, so there should be a healthy fear. There should be a healthy fear if you see a warning sign and then it says uh, high voltage, do not touch. If you could care less and then you touch that, then you're going to die. See, so there should be a common sense fear, a healthy fear. Have you seen some of these people who have no fear and do crazy stunts? That's really stupid. That's not smart. That's stupid. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to kill yourself. So that's why there should be a very healthy level of fear. All right, Proverbs chapter 1. Notice the Bible says in verse 7, the fear of the Lord, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the what? Beginning of knowledge. Beginning of knowledge. It's smart. You want to be smart? Then have some fear. <laughs> All right, go back. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. <clears throat> so Noah had that healthy fear. Notice right here, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So he prepared, as we all know, he built a huge ark, a big boat, so that he could save himself and his family. That's the saving of his house. Now, by that action, when he was building that ark to rescue his family, the verses by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. By that action he was doing, he automatically, look at that, he condemned the world. He judged the world. He was not a part of it. And because of that, he also became an heir. So he was part of the inheritance, the reward that God gave because of his righteous living. And that was all done by faith. So notice right here, Noah had a faith where his works were also involved. So go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Now what you're going to notice right here, because this is Hebrews, right? So there's a lot of Hebrew doctrine. There are Jewish doctrines that you need to uh, keep in mind here. So because it's Jews hearing about end times, 
and it's a faith that they have to hold on to, right? Remember the Antichrist, they have to resist it. They have to do a lot of work. This faith is very different from Christians. It's a faith where they have to work it out. That's a part of their salvation. For us Christians, it's a faith where we have to work, but it has nothing to do with our salvation, getting saved or lost. Why? Because it's already in us. So there's a distinction here. So in Noah's case, what you're going to notice here is that his faith, because it's falling in line with the book of Hebrews, it's not the same salvation by faith like you and I. His faith had works involved. Now, you're going to notice right here at Genesis chapter 6 what God did with Noah. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, some people will tell you that Noah was saved by grace, not by works. But in verse 8, we see matching perfectly well with Hebrews 11, where there's faith and works involved. Because in verse 8, he gets that salvation, grace, faith. But notice here in verse 9, why did he find grace? You have to think about that. Why did he find grace? If he lived wicked like the rest of the ungodly world, then it would turn out different, right? So in verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and walked with God. See that? Notice that this sounds very different from Christian salvation. In Christian salvation, there is not a just man. No one seeks after God. All have sinned come short of the glory of God. No one is perfect enough to go to heaven. But in Old Testament Jewish language, they use the word justness and perfect here. See, because it's a different setup. It's a different setup. Now, this doctrine is uh, dispensationalism, which is very important. So in dispensationalism, it's the number one doctrine that will clear 90%, if not 99% of wrong teachings. In dispensationalism, they make a big deal with distinguishing two parties, and that is Jew and the church. This distinction clears up a lot of wrong doctrines. You're going to see a lot of wrong doctrines because they fail to divide the two parties. In fact, they conglomerate or they merge the two parties and they don't see a difference. If you divide the two parties, it's going to make a lot more sense in the verses you're reading. Because there are people who will tell you that, you know, you're saved by faith, not by works. And then there are people who are going to tell you, well, if you're really saved by faith, you're really supposed to do works. And then there are other people who will say saved by faith and works. And there's just so much confusion. And why is that? Because people are pulling verses in their Bibles, uh, in the Bible right here, and they're showing verses like uh, that you can lose your salvation, that if you have genuine faith, it's going to have works. And then there are verses that show that a person doesn't do any work, but he's still saved by faith. There are verses that show people sin, so that shows that they're not really doing works, they're sinning, but they're still saved by faith. So then, oh, oh, what are we going to do with all these verses? You rightly divide verses to the right group of people to the right time period. Now, notice that that distinction is going to help you a lot. That's why I gave you that background, all right? Hebrews is one of the hardest books in the Bible to do commentary on because it's transitional, because we have to go through these two parties, actually. But that's the reason why. Do you now know why a lot of Jews hated Paul? when he introduced church age doctrine. Yeah. See, they hated him. for That makes a lot more sense now because this is something that the Jews are not used to. What are they used to? They're used to that Old Testament yeah. wording, the Old Testament salvation, the end times, the kingdom coming, the Messiah. They're used to that. All right, so uh, we see right here that Noah's faith had works involved. And you're going to notice that a lot in Hebrews chapter 11. All right, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. But nevertheless, outside of a salvation context, there's a lot of things you can apply to your Christian life here, right? Yeah. For example, Noah walked with God. Don't Christians walk with God? Yeah. Of course. Uh, don't we Christians have to live in fear, a healthy level of fear? Of course. Yeah. Three, I mean, in the verse seven, don't we condemn the world as well? Yes. yes. 
We are opposed to the world. Now notice right here that Noah's actions made, uh, he, uh, those actions he did condemn the world. Now let me show you something here. Go to John 3, John chapter 3. So his actions condemned the world. Now, remember what I talked to you about the power of binding and loosing? All right, so this, this is where everything ties down to power of binding and loosing here, okay? So the power, remember, of binding and loosing, it's been wrongly taught by the Catholic Church that only priests or uh, religious leaders have that power to forgive sins or to damn you or to retain your sins. So then there's a whole bunch of Catholics who are scared of their priests because they're afraid that they can lose their salvation depending on what so-and-so says. We don't believe in that nonsense. Amen. I don't have control over your soul, only Jesus Christ. Yeah. So you should have no fear about me and you should care less what I would do with your soul. Only Jesus Christ has the power. Amen. Now the power of binding and loosing, when Jesus... We saw, we saw those verses. We're not going to do it again, all right? Because I got to go through. You want to go through the good parts, right? Yeah. So I got to go through the nuggets right here. For some of you who uh, don't know much, you're going to have to, sorry, do catch up in my other videos, all right? So sorry. But power of binding and loosing, according to Matthew 16, I showed you when Jesus gave that to Peter, that was not only to Peter himself, who is representing the Pope or the priests, Okay. He gave it to all saved believers. When you compare that with Matthew 18, it's all saved believers. So all of us have the power of binding and loosing. Now, what's the power of binding and loosing? Forgiveness of sins and to retain the sins. It's giving the gospel. When you give the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to them, you're giving them, you're offering them the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. Second Corinthians chapter 5 also points out that we have the ministry of reconciliation. See that? We buy, uh, so uh, what we do is that we loose their sins. We're merging, we're bringing them back to God, reconciling two parties, right? God, holy sinners, right? So we see that. So we have that power. But what's the power of retaining their sins? It's when they reject you. When they reject you and the gospel, by that action they committed, you had them retain in their sins. So that is condemn the world. You see that? What does that mean, condemn the world? According to John 3, it points out being burned for, uh, being damned for hell. hell. That matches with retained in sin, rejecting the gospel. See that there? Now, if you want evidence of that, go to John 3. Look at this right here. John chapter 3, verse 17. Look at this, John 3, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to what? Condemn, condemn. condemn the world. Remember, Noah condemned the world. Okay. See that? So this has to do with salvation then. This matches with power of binding them then in their sins. Mm -hmm. See where you, you're having them damned. But that the world through him might be saved. See that? That's salvation, receiving forgiveness of sins. Amen. Okay, so... Look at this, verse 18. How do you not get condemned then? How do, you get, how do you not get your sins bound or retained, right? Power of binding in sin. Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. See that? Yes. So if you receive the gospel, then you're not condemned. You're not under the curse of the power of binding sins. Yes. Yeah. But he that believeth not is what? Condemned already. I told you so. See, when you reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're condemned. Mm -hmm. A.K.A. you're bound in your sins. Yep. Your sins are retained. The power of binding. Because why? He hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But this is, but we're not done yet. Here's the interesting part, okay? So this is how you say believers are, have the power to bind the lost people in their sins. You know how? It's not like you act all Calvinistic and you can pick and choose who's saved and who's lost. You, that's a horrible thing, obviously. You don't want to do that. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying right here is verse 19. Yeah. Look at this. And this is the what? Condemnation. Okay, he's going to define to you what the yeah. condemnation, where they're damned, a.k.a. bound in their sins, right? This is the condemnation. That what? Light is come 
into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now, did you see the definition here, what the condemnation is? It's being in darkness. All right, why? Because they love the darkness. But notice that this light, what this light does, according, I mean, if you're looking at the verses, the light exposes the darkness. So when you're shining the light, which we can say the gospel, right? The light of the gospel. When you're shining the light of the gospel, you know what you've done? What you've done is you've also condemned them as well. Wow. Power. That's powerful, that soul winning. And you take soul winning lightly. No, this ain't just a little track you're giving out to people. You know what you're dealing with? Power of binding and loosing. Amen. That's heavy stuff. That's real heavy stuff there. Why is that? Because you expose their evil. That's what happened. What does the gospel do? It shows them that they're lost sinners where they didn't recognize that before, that they're headed for hell, that they didn't recognize before. So what you've done with that gospel is you've now exposed their darkness. And that's the condemnation there. That's why they have to receive your gospel because if they don't, then they're going to... What? They're bound in their sins. They got to receive the loosing of their sins. Amen. So as you're preaching the word of God, no wonder the world hates you. Do you understand that? You know what you've done? You've condemned them. Yeah. That's what they don't like about you. You condemn them. That's why they say you're a bunch of judgmental, narrow-minded bigots, you Christians. Mm. Now do you understand? That's something spiritual going on. It's a spiritual darkness going on because you're exposing them for, for their darkness and they don't like that because they feel like that you're saying I'm a rotten sinner and that I'm going to burn in hell and you're better than me. We're not trying to say that, but if that's what you feel, then I wonder what's, what you're thinking about. Is it because we hold the light and you're not? See that? That's what you've done. You've condemned the world. So when you, that's why when you preach the word of God, which has light, what are you doing as well? Yeah. You're exposing the darkness. And what you've done is, think about this church, ready? All right, this might be a little heavy. You walk away from that church service, not right with God, getting mad and offended at the preacher. What sins have you retained and kept with you then? Yeah, come on. Preach. Anyone want an altar call after this? <laughs> All right, go to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Y'all probably hate me after this now, you know. <laughs> Y'all probably say, Pastor, you should have said that earlier, you know, because there were some sermons I didn't agree with. So now I have to go back through all your sermons and then get all those things right with God into a serious altar call. <laughs> all right, go to Matthew 5. Now, look at this. Now, this is even better. You know what's even better? than just preaching the word of God, giving the gospel. So light is associated. We've seen several things that associate with light. It's the gospel, the word of God, right? Also, testimony. Do you know why now that those co-workers of yours can't stand your testimony even though you didn't do anything wrong? Yeah, he's laughing because he can understand. I bet you y'all are laughing inside. You're just not doing it outwardly like that, brother. But now do you understand why your neighbors, your family members, they just get more mad at you? You didn't even preach at them. You didn't even say the gospel to them. They just don't like it when you pray, when you stay clean, when you say, no, I can't do that. Why? Because your testimony is light that condemned them too, that exposed their darkness. Go to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. See, your very own testimony. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Look at that. Mm -hmm. See that? What you've done is from your testimony, your works that you do, you shine the light and you give power. The power of what? Binding and loosing. How often has your pastor told you when you try to give them the gospel, when you try to pray, I told, I told you, look, just be a good testimony. That's it. And you feel like you have to say more, do more. No, 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 just be a good testimony. That's right. yep. And how many times have you seen your loved one open up to the gospel more from looking at your Glory to God. testimony? Amen. You know what that is? That's the power of binding and loosing getting onto them. Wow. 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 Because your testimony will condemn them. And God's going to use your testimony at the great white throne judgment. Hey, hey, you saw so-and-so there. So why did you reject my son? You saw what he did. You saw what she did. They've been a good testimony and they love you. They pray for you. They weren't sh cramming even Bible down your throat. You saw me working in their lives. You saw the difference. So why did you reject my son? That's something, right? All right, go to Hebrews 11. Told you this was going to be really good study. So you got the power of binding and loosing. Don't underestimate that power. Amen. All of you have that power if you're a saved believer. That's done by giving them the gospel and even simply by the testimony. The evidence is what? The evidence is John 3. John 3 showed you what the condemnation is. It's when the light shines and exposes the darkness. That's what it was. That's the condemnation. How do you shine the light then? The gospel and your testimony. We covered that. All right. Now let's go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. So uh, let me add this as a side note. When you integrate with the world, which is a lot what the problem with a lot of mega churches are doing, uh -huh. what are they doing then? Come on. See that? They're not taking their power seriously here. Wow. They're not using God's power well. They've compromised with the darkness and they want to settle down in the dark and pretend that light doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. That's serious. Yep. That's very serious. That verse 7 says fear. Yeah. They don't have fear after that? Yeah. All right, let's look at verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. Okay, in other words... Now we come to the next biblical character, Abraham. And this is actually my favorite part that I want to cover tonight. And here am I delaying again. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so Abraham had a lot of faith that when God called him to go to a place where he had no idea, Abraham obeyed God's calling and went out into a place a place where what? He should after receive for an inheritance. A place where he doesn't get the inheritance now, but after. That's big. Mm. Now that's faith. So you've heard so many times, if you serve the Lord, God will bless you. But when you're undergoing the pain and the trial, you're like, where is it? And you lose your faith, right? Abraham, he didn't have that. When God gave him a promise that he'd bless him, Abraham had so much faith that even though he wasn't currently receiving it, but that it would be after, he just went by faith. Amen. Amen. That's big. Amen. But this is even bigger when you look at the last part of verse 8. And he went out not knowing whither he went. So he went to a place where he had no idea where he would go. Abraham, where are you going? Why are you moving out? You're, you're moving away from your comforts, your family, and everything. So don't you have at least a plan or something? Nope. Aren't you worried about how you're going to take care of your wife and everything? And uh, you don't have kids. How are you going to have kids? And I have faith in God. Now, you know, that's real faith. The kind of faith that you want, that I envy, that I, that I don't have, that I'll have to admit. Because I'm such a logical thinker. That's my problem, all right? I always have to connect the dots and see something that makes sense. So God, has to, uh, God taught me so many times the problem with reason, yeah. rationality. 
There's a problem with that one. With faith, strong faith. Imagine having a faith that you have no idea, but you know to be true. No idea, but know it's true. Now, how do you do that kind of a faith? Because let's say that uh, you're called to be a missionary, but imagine taking your wife and kids, yeah. taking them to a foreign mission field where you weren't prepared at all about the consequences and everything that was going to happen. You gave up family and comfort and everything in life to go to a place, even a place where you don't know. Now, I don't know of any missionary like that. There is some level of faith that they do have, don't get me wrong, but I don't hear something completely like that because usually that's scowled upon, all right? That's frowned upon because you have to have some planning, some idea. Otherwise, the church is not going to support you because <laughs> they want to make sure the missionary knows what he's doing. But this is a type of faith, and God does this, where you do something, listen, you do something but you have no idea. That's right. Now, I had a hard time comprehending that. Why? Because that's my problem. I'm always a rational thinker. And I've seen so many people who made foolish decisions because they go by feeling, not by faith. Come on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, a on. person ha feels that this is what God wants me to do, and then quite often when I counsel them or talk to them, uh, uh, what, uh, I don't think that's why. So have you thought about this? This is a consequence that would happen. This and that. Are you sure? Oh, are, are you sure? Uh, you're, you're just, aren't you just feeling it? No, no, I know God told me. And they don't even give me uh, good evidences. They don't even give me good explanations why. I just don't know why, but I just know it. And I'm like, okay. And then they mess up and they hurt themselves. You know how many times that happened? 100% of the time. So then... How do we have a faith? See that? That's a difficulty for us to grasp. How do we have a faith where we know it's true, but we have no idea? This is, that's why this is my favorite part of the teaching, all right? If you want that kind of faith, and I want that kind of faith, there are three things here that will help you immensely. First of all, don't forget the basic ingredients to faith. One, two, and three. Verse one, two, and three. What is faith? The author defined it for you. Now, faith is the substance of things what? Hope. hope for. It's a strong hope. Yeah. How do you develop a strong hope? A strong hope is developed. Go to Romans 5. Mm, come on. Some of you already now know. See, some of you now know. How do you get that strong hope? From a strong experience. Now, if it was an experienced preacher of many years who made a decision for the church, hey, I don't know, uh, I don't have any plans, I don't know what to do, but this is what I believe God told me to do, so we're going to proceed with this church. A lot of you members would probably follow along my decision, right? Even if I don't give any details or I have no idea, but I know it's true. Why? Because you trust my experience. You've seen that. When you have a lot of experience, experienced people don't really have to do much planning or preparing. They go by instinct. Experience. They go by experience, what they went through. Wow. See, so that's the reason why they don't really have to have any ideas. They just know it's true because they already experienced it. So it's a strong experience that will help you with that. And experience comes from patience. Not by immature feelings that you go by radical impulse and you assume that's what God told you to do and it didn't turn out to be that way. No, it's, the truth is you're just impatient and fleshly. Comes from patience, which comes from what? Trials. When a person went through all the problems and they've overcome, that's why you can trust that person. But a person who's immature, who didn't go through it, that's why you can't really take their word for it. Yeah. That if they say that, I have no idea, but I know it's from God, then you tend to hesitate. You tend to get a little fearful of those people. Romans 5, all right? Romans 5. 
And then we'll start out at verse 1. So it's a strong hope. So if you have a strong hope, then you have a strong faith. Romans 5. And then verse 3. Verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh what? Patience. patience. And patience what? Experience. experience. And experience what? Hope. hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. So you have no shame and you're confident like Abraham, that what God told you to do is exactly what God told you to do. All right, now let's go back here. Here's a second one that will help you. Verse 2, verse 2. For by it an elders obtained a what? Good report. So this faith is supposed to give them a good testimony. Good report. That's your second answer here. So how you know that you have the right faith is because of your testimony. So then there are church members, for example, that I would counsel and I would hesitate on some of the decisions they make and they think that this is what God led them to do. But because of their testimony, see that? And I've seen how God used them and I've seen how they've yielded to God. Then I say, okay, well, let's try it out, brother or sister. If you believe that's what the Lord led you to do, let's try it out and see what happens. Why? Because of that testimony. But if it's the first time you're in the church, I don't do that with them. Because <laughs> I, I have no testimony to lean upon to see. So you have to uh, look at your testimony as well. Okay, so this is very helpful. All of this is planted on this ground right here of faith. A faith that you have no idea, but you know it's true. You want that? I know all of you want that. If you want that, these are the essential ingredients you need to go by. The last one, which is a no-brainer, is verse 3. Because of faith, we know that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So if God's Word says so, even though we don't have the scientific evidence for now, we know it's true. So a lot of people, though they always scoffed about in Revelation chapter 11, how is the whole world going to see the bodies of these two dead witnesses? No one could understand that. But they said, I know that's what the Bible says, so I take it by faith. Guess what now? Then television came, and more so than that, everyone, including kids nowadays, which is scary, are getting cell phones. So they can watch and see what happens now. See, that's faith because of what God's word says so. So here's the thing. If any of you want that kind of a faith, now I know you want that because I do, all right? Or maybe it's just me. But I always envied this and I always wanted this. How do I have a faith where I have no idea, but I know it's true? God had to put me through some of this. He had to put me through some of this. And only the close loved ones that I have would know what I had to do. I stressed, I strained. I had to ignore every pastoral advice and everybody's advice. Didn't you know that? I had to do that. Now, that's not recommended, obviously. But see, there are sometimes exceptional, really hard scenarios, unique scenarios, that you're completely in the dark and you have to trust God and not people. So I had to go through that. And how did I know that? Because these three. And they helped me. And they affirmed my faith and my decision. And I had to take a leap of faith. Now, some of those people recognize the decisions that I make, and they approve what I do now. But back then, I had even pastors, too, who disapprove of me. All right? But then later on, they come to realize that the Lord's hand was in it. Yeah. Why? That's an example of strong faith where God was testing me if I were to trust God or some pastor whom I respect or love or adored. Wow, that's, good. that's really huge there. Amen, that's really huge. So, that's a, so you're going to have to have a faith where you're going to have to go against family, against everyone. I had to do that. But how this comes is, see this here? Then this and then this which helped me have that strong hope. I knew, I knew the decision I made was the right one. I knew it. 
And I had to do it. I had to follow God's calling. I had the word of God. I knew that book from cover to cover. So I knew what I did was the right decision. My testimony that I had, I knew for the sake of testimony, if I went by the other pastor's suggestions or my family's suggestions or other people's suggestions, I'd lose my testimony. I knew that I, my testimony would be retained by doing it God's way. And then this thing, that hope, that certainty was there because of what God put me through. Now, I hope this is probably the most valuable lesson you're going to get tonight. Now, if you want that kind of a faith and you envy that and you long for that, you need to go by these three ingredients that are so essential. Amen. All right. Now we're going to go to verse 9. Verse 9. Uh, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. So Abraham, by faith, he had to dwell. Temp uh, he had to live temporarily. So he he didn't live permanently uh, in the land that he was residing. It was just temporary. He was wandering in the land of promise. So where he was residing, which we know is the land of Canaan, which is the nation of Israel today. That was what, what God promised him for his land. As in a strange country. So it's a total strange country to him. Strange land. He doesn't know. Dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him of the same promise. He had to live in tents. That's what the tabernacles are. So he didn't build a permanent home or a city. And his sons, Isaac and then grandson Jacob who were heirs with Abraham, with that same promise, that same inheritance, they had to also live in tents. They didn't live there permanently. <clears throat> that was all faith. Why? Verse 10, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Because Abraham instead was looking for a city that had foundations. Now, his place was tents. Like I told you, he had no city he built, no home. So whatever city he was looking at, it had found actual foundations where God was the builder and maker. See that? So God's the one building and making. Now, this is very important. You're going to hear majority of commentators say this the wrong way. They're going to say that this place that Abraham was residing in was actually referring to New Jerusalem, which is not true. It's not referring to New Jerusalem. Oh, excuse me. We're going to look at Revelation 21. Now, keep your hand at Hebrews 11, all right? I'm going to show you some things here. Is this referring to New Jerusalem, or is it referring to the current Jerusalem that you see, the current Jerusalem. So it is a earthly Jerusalem, which is going to be the promised Jerusalem, the land of promise. That's where Jesus Christ is reigning on the earth for 1,000 years. So he promised the Jews an earthly kingdom. That's what the Jews were anticipating. They weren't anticipating New Jerusalem something spiritual that will come down out of heaven. They weren't expecting that, they, some spiritual city. This is a literal earthly city, piece of dirt, the actual nation of Israel that you see, and God's going to transform that like into a garden of Eden. They're going to have their earthly kingdom in Jerusalem. That's the reason why, uh, forget it, I'm going to go on filter mode again, forget that. Okay, let's go back here. So we go to Revelation 21 and Ezekiel 48, uh, 48, please. Ezekiel 48. Go to Revelation 21, and then I want you to go to Ezekiel 48. Now notice that God promised the Jews a city that God will give to the nation of Israel. But this city given to the nation of Israel is very different from New Jerusalem. You're going to see that. Go to Ezekiel 48 and then verse 35. Verse 35. 
It was round about 18,000 measures. And the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. Now, if you read Ezekiel 40 through 48, it gives the entire details of this city that God promised the nation of Israel that he's going to build for them one day. Now, this city has been conflated with New Jerusalem at Revelation 21. So keep your hand here and go to Revelation 21. This has been conflated with Revelation 21, the New Jerusalem. Go to Revelation chapter 21, and then we'll look at verse 16, Revelation chapter 21, and we'll look at verse 16. The Bible points out the New Jerusalem, and the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Now notice that this is New Jerusalem at Revelation 21, okay? That's from Revelation 21.10. That's the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. That's that spiritual city. Now this is what? 12,000 furlongs. That's a lot bigger compared to Ezekiel 48 verse 35. 18,000 measures. See, these two cities, they're different. Why? Ezekiel 48 is talking about Jerusalem itself that God will build, that he promised them. Revelation 21 is new Jerusalem. See that? You would think that God already gave the hint that there's a different Jerusalem. Now, if you look at Hebrews 11 again, Hebrews 11 will prove that Abraham, when he was on this land, that he was not looking for some kind of spiritual city or some, something that is from heaven. That's not what Abraham is seeking after. He's not thinking about dying and going to heaven like all of us. No, this is a, a literal earthly city that God promised him. That's what Abraham was expecting. But here's the thing. The verse said the following. Several clues here. One is, verse 9, he sojourned in what? In the land of promise. See, so that actual place he was in, that Jerusalem would later be built, that was the land that God promised. But why is it that Abraham, <coughs> he had faith and he wasn't permanently dwelling there? We know why, because the city that he was promised was after because remember back at verse 8, which he should receive for an inheritance, uh, which he should after receive for an inheritance. Abraham didn't receive it at his time. It had to take, what, thousands of years later with Joshua and King David and Solomon. See that? They were getting built that time. But you know what happened? The Jews rejected it. So then God had to... Uh, so the nation of Israel lost their nation and then Jesus the Messiah came and they had their chance again, but they rejected their king. So God had to postpone it 2,000 years and they're going to have to wait till when? The millennium, the end times. So that's what they're waiting for. That's what they're waiting for. Like the disciples said to Jesus, will you restore again the kingdom to Israel before Jesus went up to heaven? And Jesus didn't say, no, I'm not. It's a spiritual city. He didn't say that. He said, it is not for you to know the times and seasons. See that? Why? Because there's a clock going on where he delayed it, where there were temporary moments where the Jews rejected it. There were those transitional clocks, and he had to delay it 2,000 years. Okay, let's go back to Hebrews <coughs> chapter 11 again. Verse 11. All right, let's close it off here. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. So Sarah, by faith, she herself was able to receive the strength to bring forth a child, conceive seed. So she was delivered of a child. So she was able to give birth to a baby even though she was past age. She was so past age, she was old, but she was able to give birth. That's a miracle. Why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. Because she judged. 
And judgment is making a decision, a serious decision, passing the sentence that, okay, God, I'm going to hold you to your word, that you're going to be faithful to what you promised right. that I would have a child. Now, this is very important, which is very interesting. Go to James 1, James 1. Go to the book of James chapter 1. Now, this is something that the ladies would like to hear, okay? And the guys too, obviously. Go to James 1. Now, Sarah, she had faith that she would deliver a child. But if you look at Hebrews 11, look at that verse again. She received strength, strength yeah. to conceive yeah. by faith. What does that mean then? What that means then, if that verse is, if those words aren't there by faith, then what does that mean? She won't have the strength to conceive seed. Yeah. But because she had faith, that's why she was able to conceive seed. Now, when you're giving birth to a baby, it's going to take a lot of mental draining, mental ability, mental power. You see these nurses and these people, come on, push, you can do it. You can do, they have to give them that faith. They have to have a lot of faith, ability, that way they can give birth properly. So what's the point here? The point is, if she didn't have faith, she probably would have had a miscarriage. So that's something very important. She had to have faith so that she can receive the strength to what? Gain the promise. The child, the promise. That's good. What if she didn't have faith? If she didn't have faith, then that means then she doesn't have the strength to give birth to the promise. You ever recall those statements, those verses in the Bible where Jesus uh, was able to give the promise to heal, promise to cast out the devil because of their faith. faith. Yeah. Now look, if you don't have faith then, this is important, if you don't have faith, you won't have the strength to, to produce from your seed of faith to produce the fruit of promise that God has given to you. Well, now you wonder why God's not blessing your life then. Because your seed of faith is not strong, where it's not giving, it's not producing the fruit. You want fruit? I know all of you want fruit in your life. Then you need a strong faith. If the seed is contaminated, if it's the seed's messed up, it ain't going to have the strength, the power, the ability to, give, uh, to bring forth good fruit. Go to James 1. Look at this. God even pointed that out, that he's not going to be able to answer prayer, even though he has the power to answer everything, that he won't do it if you have a lack of faith, if your faith is shaky. Look at James 1, 6. James 1, 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Well, I prayed about it. God's not answering. You wonder why? Come on. Your lack of faith. That's why God's not answering. That's good preaching. And maybe that's why you've been praying for years. Come on. All right. You know what I believe? I believe God can answer it right at this moment. And his timetable is better than my timetable. And no matter how bad life is or how good life is, his way is always best. That's what I believe. And by that seed... Even no matter how long it takes, it's going to give birth to good fruit. I'm going to get that promise. Sarah had to wait years to get her child a promise. Through, uh, through an impossible, already she's too late. She can't give birth to children. She's already too late. But see, that's what faith does. The promise does. This is so amazing with our God. Even if you're too late... Or in your mind, you think it's too late, right? We always put God at a timetable, and that's our mistake. That's our mistake. You never do that. Then God's going to teach you something if you put him on a timetable. What you have to do is that God, he will do things even when you're past the timetable. That's what faith requires. Faith requires that even if it's too late for me to give birth to promise, 
I believe that God will give it to me and that will produce that strength to give birth to the promise. Faith is so important. Because think about it. If Sarah didn't believe and she was having that child, then either who, her womb will be dead or when she's struggling to give birth, she could use the excuse, I'm too old, I can't push. Oh, it's too painful. I can't do it. I'm a very unique case. My trial is so unique. My pain is so unique. So I can't give birth to a baby. Does that sound like some of us? Come on. Wow. Preach. That sounds like us. That's right. And because of that, then you won't believe. Believing is so important because it gives you strength That's right. to push. All right? Amen. Amen. All right, then. I hope you got a blessing tonight. And uh, I got, uh, man, this guy, I got two other goodies. So I, I didn't cover this part. But this lines up with this very well. I, I can't wait to tell you next time. All right? Lots of good stuff with this faith.